Hello, I'm Tina Chang, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2020 Brooklyn Book Festival. We are here today with authors Mark Bibbins, Eduardo C. Corral, Hafiza Jeter, and Jonah Mixon Webster. The theme of today's reading and discussion is The Past is Present. The authors will read from their new collections and discuss how history and legacy serve as a lens in their work through which to view the present moment. Before we begin, I want to let you know that the books by the authors in this program can be purchased in the link provided. I'll begin by reading the author's bios in the order in which they will read. Jonah Mixon Webster is a poet, educator, and interdisciplinary artist from Flint, Michigan. His debut poetry collection, Stereotype, received the 2019 Penn America Joyce Osterweil Award and was a finalist for the 2019 Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry. His poetry and hybrid works are featured in Callaloo, Yale Review, Best New Poets, and elsewhere. Born in Zaria, Nigeria, Hafiza Jeter is a Nigerian-American poet, writer, and editor. Her poetry and prose have appeared in The New Yorker, Tin House, Boston Review, among others. An editor for Little A and Topple Books, she is the author of the debut poetry collection, Un-American, from Wesleyan University Press. Eduardo C. Corral is the author of the poetry collection, Guillotine. He's the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Hotter Fellowship, and the National Holmes Poetry Prize from Princeton University. He teaches in the MFA program in creative writing at North Carolina State University. Mark Bibbins is the author of four collections of poetry, most recently, 13th Balloon from Copper Canyon Press, his first book, Sky Lounge, received a Lambda Literary Award. Bibbins lives in New York City and teaches in the graduate writing programs of the New York School of the New School, Columbia University, and in NYU's Writers in Florence program. Welcome, everybody. So, hi, Jonah. If you wouldn't mind starting us off with your reading, that would be great. No problem. No problem. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Uh, hey, everybody. All the panelists. It's uh, really good to to be joining you all uh, today. So um, I'm gonna keep it short, a couple poems. Um, this is Black Ontology number five. Black as if always the blues. Of a stridulated half note, night gristle, locust chirp, bold neck, wax lips, wet stain. A body thronged hard and buried in the open light. The root of it, dug up with a mouth, stretched, reaching to scratch the noose from his throat and give everyone a song. Always I was a nigga, bad at it. I was always being a nigga, even when I wasn't, I was a nigga. Somebody's I was always bad at being, even when I was a nigga, I wasn't. I was bad at being a nigga, though I wasn't. I was bad at being a nigga, even though I was a real nigga, or a bad nigga, or a bitch nigga, or a fag nigga, which I always was, always been bad, always a nigga, though I was bad at it, I was bad, <laughs> nigga. I was always a bad nigga, kept me a hot nigga, always nigga, always a nigga, it's always a damn nigga, it's always a nigga bad at it, and always I was a nigga, and always I was bad, and bad, and bad. Really, I'm a real nigga, cause all my niggas say I'm a real nigga, and I bet if you go and ask them niggas, they gonna point at me and say, that's a real nigga, really, though. I'm bad at it. I am, really. Black ontology number 10, the real nigga and disintegration. at this juncture, inexorable meaning, through erasure, in the signal of the edge, the, the rib, the meat, the fat, the flesh, the coin, the silver, the blood, the juice, the box, the, the bird, the feather, the milk, the lamb, the bottle, the, 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 
the lash, the nick, the dime, the dove, the dust, the saw, the, the, the shore, the shine, the shell, the man, the bull, the, the, the cup, the, 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 the air, the car, the sick, the, the, the sheep, the shield, the, the, the thief, the mill, the muscle, the meat, the minister, the glass, the draw, the weather, the wind, the soft, the wear, the word, the draw, the, the, the skit, the skin, the, 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 the fit, the fit, the, the, the tassel, the, 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 the zip, the fourth, the stack, the save, the damn, the deacon, the deck, the, 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 the brain, the, the, the cave, the star, the scan, the tip, the hand, the drain, the job, the, the, the jest, the, 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 the skull, the head, the, 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 the jip, the kin, the, the, the kilt, the, the, the can, the ship, the, the, the shake, the, the kick, the chill, the stream, the lake, the river, the marsh, the cat, the slit, the juke, the, the, the bread, the bread, the break, the, 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 the chin, the tent, the bush, the, 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 the clutch, the lair, the, 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 the hush, the, the, the plead, the thrift, the, 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 the reed, the ring, the brass, the roach, the, the, the foot, the just the shade, the scope, the, 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 the Mr. Man, the, the market, the, 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 the screw, the, the, the lead, the ruger, the, the, the Mr. The Master, the matter, the, 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 the take, the shake, the bend, the gym, the case, the, the, the flip, the hex, the chin, the use, the chops, the knife, the shit, the the glass, the oh, the, the the stew, the shroom, the pitch, the throw, the, 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 the push, the mirror, the mill, the grid, the dupe, the shun, the patch, the, the bull, the badge, the, the, the sand, the seat, the walk, the, the, the jail, the maker, the type, the light, the spell, the gate, the blast, the post, the, tri the twitch, the bunker, the trench, the valley, the book, the script, the, the, the jacket, the church, the boy, the, the, the limb, the line, the axle, the tether, the, the limb, the stout, the lame, the bag, the toast, the, the, the gild, the flicker, the, 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 the turn, the, the cure, the code, the the disc, the the cook, the gene, the oil, the glue, the murk, the pot, the score, the the, the shook. Ah, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Jonah. Thank you, uh, Hafiza. Could you? Thank you. Speak for us. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Jonah, that was an incredible reading. I was reading along with you and just like, just the technical skill to read what you've written is amazing. Um, so I'm gonna read two poems and I'm gonna, uh, the first one's gonna be the opening from the book. Thank you. The Pledge. With dirt under her fingernails, our mother held our father's hands. The years marked, hoping one of his paintings would sell. The two of them always in search of auspices, their daughters, their last blood. My sister and I, we were jackknives, a long division, splitting them consonants wide, seeds blown and planted, Zarya to Boston, black fruit of Akron winters, Africans hyphenated down to a promise, cultivated inside the sunlit chains of our father's south. While our mother resurrected in the dark, her prayers are half grief, the spell of protection. She told us what he would not give us, we were forbidden to name. But Allah, like color staining a porcelain sink, I've lain with woman, our mother lost to myth. I am a test of how far a daughter's memory can go. Our father, a wilted shoot of wheat, wavering against the wind, never expected to age alone in his birth country. Our bondage stretches our ghosts in all directions, trying to outpick the rot America has grown in our throats. How to bring your children to America. The mothers became targets, hanging on clotheslines, bibs of the barely fed, children, countries, born, split in two, firstborns whose first steps aborted their sisters, brothers, the fresh bread of their love language, children, the English, tearing sphinxers in two. The mothers came by boat with wings, forgetting their own mother's uteruses, singing praises to Allah. They came over and over again until it could not matter that so and so had died. We were the nicknames escaping their bellies. The translation between stay and never arrived. Husbands, uncles, we were wives, illnesses, pawpaw seeds, only thing that could save them, sickle cells that knew better than to touch. Visible only in their dialect, they sent for cousins, wired money, forgave ancestors we couldn't trust. 
they stopped speaking to us and our birth language until we became new dictionaries, became the continents of the constitution they studied, our first words forgotten artifacts in our home countries. They were the ones whose fathers had died in the milt of language without daughters. In America, we were memories without accents or consensus, lambs that couldn't be traded for milk, meal, or honey. The fact of our bodies in America, their new Quran, and oh, how they moaned, how they starved, sucking their teeth between King's English, yelling for us to stop playing immigrant and go get naturalized. Thank you. Thank you, Hafiza. Thank you so much. Eduardo, could you read for us? Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, thank you uh, for this uh, honor. Uh, I'm going to read uh, two books. Uh, two books. Is, is that scary? That statement? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear, you hear that on a panel. Right. I'm going to read. <laughs> read two whole books for us. We would love it. <laughs> Hurry, Eduardo, hurry. Here. Uh, from the second book, Guillotine. Uh, the first poem is about unrequited love, falling in love with somebody who can return that emotion, that energy, and also, also weaves in growing up at the height of the AIDS epidemic. <clears throat> Autobiography of my hungers. His beard, an avalanche of honey, an avalanche of thorns. In a bar too close to the Pacific, he said, I don't love you, but not because I couldn't be attracted to you. Liar, even my soul is pot-bellied. Thinness in my mind equals the gay men on the nightly news, kissed by death and public scorn. The anchorman declaring weight loss is one of the first symptoms. The Portuguese have a word for imaginary, never to be experienced love, whoop de doo I don't love you, he said. The words flung him back. In his eyes, I saw it. To another bar, where a woman sidestepped his desire, another hunger, our friendship. In 10th grade, weeks after my first kiss, my mother said, you're looking thinner. That evening, I smuggled a cake into my room. I ate it with my hands, licked buttercream off my thumbs until I puked. Desire with no future, bitter longing. I starve myself by yearning for intimacy that doesn't and won't exist. Holding hands on a ferry, tracing with the tip of my tongue a jawline. In a bar too close to the Pacific, he said, I don't love you, but not because I couldn't be attracted to you. His beard, an avalanche of thorns an avalanche of honey. Part of the second book is a sequence of vo voice poems, uh, persona poems, and the voice of Mexicans and Central Americans moving uh, through the Arizona desert, um, moving from Mexico, the Central America, into this country. And uh, human rights organizations set up uh, plastic, blue, plastic blue water uh, stations. And when I first saw the photograph of one of these uh, water stations, one of these water barrels, I imagined them as texts, as places where these uh, he, these human beings, immigrants, my gente, my people, would scratch their their rants, their confessions, their jokes. So this is one of those voices, a man uh, thinking of his children as he moves to the desert. And the whole sequence is titled Testaments Scratched into a Water Station Barrel. Far from highways, I flicker. Gold, the whispering gasoline. If I pinch her nipples too hard, no joy for her, no joy for me. So I practice on ticks, press them just so, so they give, but do not burst. Beneath my boots, Thistle and puncture vine, a wild horse asleep on all fours, its shadow still grazing, my lips black meat, my tongue black meat, in my backpack sardine tins, saltines, and a few cough drops. The moon is my library, 
There's a glacier inside a grain of salt. Do you understand? I'm sorry, my Albanian isn't very good. Tremble if God forgets you. Tremble if God remembers you. Out of clay, I shape sparrows. I glaze their bills and claws. I give them names like gossamer, Inglenook, lagoon. She bathed a trumpet in milk, her tenderness acoustic and plural, her pupils perched in all that green. There's nudity around the corner, bones cracked and iridescent. Sometimes it rains so hard, even the moon puts on a raincoat. Zinc raz, zinc jazz, I notch my arms, I notch my thighs. Five, six days, I score my skin, but not the back of my knees. Two ovals, two portraits. My son at 10, his eyes ablaze. My son at one, his eyes shut. Once I dressed them in burlap. Once bicycles and marbles. Once I tore rain out of a parable to strike down his thirst. Gracias, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. Okay, Mark, can you hear from me? Thanks, Tina. Um, Thank you, Mark. Really an honor to, to be with all four of you today. Um, so I'm going to read uh, the, the, I call this an elegy in pieces, uh, and the, the individual pieces don't have titles. Um, and the two that I'm going to read are, um, I think, uh, go with the, the theme of today's reading. We'll see. The opposite of irony is not sincerity, it's hopelessness. Speaking of which, I was struck by how handsome one of the commuters stepping over us was as I lay with ACT UP on the floor of Grand Central Station at 5.07 p.m. on January, January 23rd, 1991, and how effectively that handsomeness seemed to amplify the anger in his eyes. Everything about him said he would be perfectly happy to kick any of us in the head for imp interrupting his timely egress to Westchester, but he was well enough versed in the ways of rage to know what would have happened if he'd done it. Only now do I recognize the humor in ACT UP dropping over the arrivals board, a banner that read one AIDS death every eight minutes, mm. and that I was lucky to have the luxury of deciding not to get myself arrested that day. Today is March 30th, the 30th anniversary of ACT UP, and tomorrow Gilbert Baker, the man who created the rainbow flag, will die. Strange not to know whether one's life has an asterisk hanging next to it, or is itself the asterisk. Strange to look vainly for oneself in history, and stranger to realize that there is a chance one might find oneself there. It's halfway through October 2017, and today New York woke up finally to what feels like it could be fall, and the news that a school district in Mississippi is planning to kill a mockingbird again. And nobody, because white people are quadrupling down so spectacularly on their bullshit this year, is surprised. Last week I quoted someone out of context about irony, and in doing so probably made myself some extra enemies. Later, my friend mentioned tenor and vehicle, the two components of metaphor, but it's no use. I can never remember which is which. I'm afraid I don't respond to stimuli in the way I'm supposed to. I tried looking up the size of a blue whale's heart, and it turns out, no, it's not as big as a small car after all. But the National Geographic website reassures everyone that it's still pretty big and that the blue whale's heart needs a better metaphor. The website asks, how big is your own heart? When we find out that the president has made a joke about the vice president wanting to hang all the gays, our hearts are not surprised. Nor is it exactly surprise I read on the apostle Thomas's face where Caravaggio has painted him slipping with Jesus's help, one finger into the hole in Jesus's side, a hole that remember, resembles other things that also are holes. We're told it's doubt that drives Thomas, and perhaps that's close enough. 
it looks like he's about to stroke the human heart of Jesus, but for the fact that the hole is on the wrong side. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Well, I was just um, noting that the experience of the Brooklyn Book Festival or any reading is that I love that sort of deep guttural sound that people make when they're agreeing with something. So it was really great to just see everybody nodding their heads and in agreement or feeling like something's really powerful. I always thought I didn't like those deep guttural sounds that people make in the audience. And now <laughs> I'm just really missing it. You know, um, I think the poet Rachel Eliza Griffith is like, oh, it's like when like, people suck their teeth after popcorn or something, the sound that you sort of need at the, at the reading. So thank you all for, just such powerful readings of your work. I wanted to start off with asking you about just the beginnings. So in each of your books, uh, they truly have their own universes, their own stories of loss, their own singular journeys. Can you walk us through the genesis of each of your collections and how you approached past and history in your work? That's a, that's a softball there, too. <laughs> <Yeah. Thanks. laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. So there's, to... there's always that long silence for the first question. <laughs> I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's a great question, though, Tina. Wow. I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, it's so great. Would you mind saying it, repeating it once more? Yeah, sure. I was just talking about, so I was just noting how each of your books are so incredibly different from each other, but they all engage with the past and history in different ways. Some of them, for example, are through family members, some of them through, through chosen family, uh, like friendships. Um, how did you approach uh, the past and history in your work? Or if, if that's like maybe too broad, can you talk a little bit about how this book began for you? Maybe Jonah, you can start. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for you know restating that question. I think that's just a really good question. Um, yes, I think for me, uh, it's completely rooted in a sense of, you know, kind of um, lineage. Right, I think um, you know the book opens up with invocation of the sacrosanct, and um, in it, I kind of you know dedicate, or it's kind of like you know an after you know a, a bunch of you know ancestors in the list, you know even like some some living folks. So um, you know it's uh, after William Wells Brown, Tisa Bryant, Linda Carpio, Charles Chestnut, Douglas Kearney, Adrian Piper, Richard Pryor, Ishmael Reed, Carol Walker, and Bert Williams, and so like by like kind of invoking um, like the kind of the, the spirits and also like the um, the work, right? The very serious work that all these people have kind of contributed to, you know, the, the traditions of um, African-American literature and storytelling and performance. Um, I wanted to first kind of, you know, be very firmly rooted, right? In those traditions and in those conversations um, as they have inspired me, right? Um, and so what also kind of brings me to is thinking about, you know, this quote, something that Ishmael Reed said about like <clears throat> certain black stereotypes being regarded as being like so sacred or maybe also so profane that <laughs> they're like untouchable. All right. And so like, um, for me, like the, the entire book stereotype, um, you know, it follows the figure of the real nigga, which is kind of like a figure that's haunted my life. Right. What does it mean? No, you know, just these issues of, you know, about manhood, um, it's a very specific type of black, malehood right um that's kind of been imposed on me since a child you know i was like out in at nine years old and ever since then it was just ever since then it was just like you know i had to be this real nigga like i knew i had to be a real nigga when i was a kid and that was one of the first kind of experiences of selfhood or developing selfhood that i think i first kind of came into right um you know, I was almost jumped, I jumped to a gang at like eight years old. Um, I saw my first gun at like, you know, like eight years old, nine years old, stuff like that, right? And so just kind of thinking about that performance of the real nigga and then, you know, in the way I'm trying to enter into this, um, this or embody, um, or slipping out in and out of that embodiment, right, of this figure of the real nigga and do so in a way that, you know, is very richly connected and, um, you know, and, and kind of stringently informed by um, these past performances, these past, you know, um, kind of approaches 
and dialogues and things like that. And so um, as the kind of the book goes on, you know, it's just these different scenarios. You see this figure, the real nigga, like kind of slip in and out of. Um, and for me, it's one that's completely like kind of, you know, involved with the past um, as a way of, you know, like this constant propagation of images, right, that, you know, Black people have ha are, have are forced to live against all the time and are forced to, you know, subvert. It's like, you know, it's a, it's a non-ending iterative process. And I think this was one that my poetics is entirely, you know, kind of um, obsessed with and compelled by right um it is these kind of these self-same like over and over recursive just images and recursive performances that are you know um you know it, they, they the risk value is, is life or death right if you perform act the wrong way you know you have us you know it's very very um and the, the precarity of it is you know is it's stronger than i think people, we actually realize like a stuff the, the thing and it goes for a lot of different you know right um embodiments but for this in this book particular it was thinking about right how precarious is it you know for even just a person like me like a gay black man trying to slip in and out of these different types of performances of masculinity one wrong move i'm dead <laughs> and so um mm -hmm. and so that's essentially how the book and then these other compounding issues with the flint water crisis um and then the, when i reapproached this text um Thinking about those things compounding also with with um, you know, the COVID nineteen situation right now, because um, this book is actually haunting me itself. Because this book is going to be re released, and so like I now I'm reworking it and going back over it again. <laughs> um, now that the you know it's done, so so it's really I don't know. It's weird. I don't know if that answers the question at all. <laughs> it did. It did. Thank you, Jonah. Um, Hafiza, did you um, want to? Speak? speak to to the creation because I thought maybe I heard some connections to this sense of belonging that mm -hmm. Jonah was talking about could you talk a little bit about your book and maybe some of those themes or themes that are completely yeah, mm -hmm. yeah uh, I love that Jonah read uh his poems on hauntology because I've actually been like looking into hauntology for a non-fiction project that I'm working on and like hauntology is like from Derrida's um, like 93 theory of like the study of what is not. Um, and this idea that like, that like the present is always haunted with the past. And so, I mean, if, if that didn't describe one black life into this country, I don't know like what else could. And I also love like, you know, this like the fact that like this white French philosopher who essentially grew up in like, like a French Al in Algeria and like uh, never left his like his like a 20 mile square radius for like 20 years comes up with this word that sounds like like my black grandmother who's born in alabama like and had a fourth grade education like brought up it's just like it's so black this idea of hauntology you're like wait what and if that's not a haunting i don't know what it is you know um but when i like, you know, in terms of thinking of beginnings, I think like beginnings are such a tricky thing in this country. And what is, what is a, what is a beginning? Like white people, sorry, bibs, love to start uh, <laughs> like, um, like <laughs> beginnings with themselves in this country. But like, anytime you're starting a beginning with yourself, it's too late. And so for, to this, for this book, you know, I think, you know, I began this book in one end, just trying to like, understand and unpack grief and like what it d did to the body um especially in terms of like you know my mother's death from a stroke and then like how that manifested in like physical illness for my father um and so it was it was really trying to find like um a connection to how like how we wear this country physically emotionally and essentially the go like the ghost outlines of where belonging and restriction exists because when you think about like you can think of the un and american in a perpetual like um parentheses for like for for everyone here even you know um because like anyone who's here like because he's not straight white so like we're all living on this like inside that parentheses in some way um and in terms of like the beginning like the um the opening poem that i read it was actually like the last poem i wrote for the collection and I wrote it last summer, um, me uh, and my wife, we went on like a family vacation with my family to Gambia. And like, I hadn't been back to Africa since like my mom died. Um, and so it like uh, my brother-in-law's from there. And so we were just like visiting his family. And so I was really thinking about 
what it meant to be born into like two halves, you know, on one end, Nigerian and one end American. And then like what it meant to be in proximity to a continent that I no longer have um, and away from a continent that won't really claim me. Um, and then, so like, if that's a beginning, then where do you go from there? And so I think try to like really unpack that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you said something so interesting about um, or origins, you know, so I, it sort of brought me to the idea, like, where, where do our stories begin? Like, at what point does a story begin? Like, is it a personal story set against a yeah. national story for a, a lot of us who cross borders and continents and find ourselves in many different places, not just our physical bodies, but also just culturally, historically, where does that, sto where does that story begin? And so I guess, you know, yeah. Eduardo, look, looking at your work and thinking about your first book, Slow Lightning, and the present book, I almost saw a continuation of that story because oftentimes between uh, books, I oftentimes see like, okay, one book ended and then the other book begins and it's so com completely separate project. So in terms of origin, there was almost like a continuation of the story so that the first and the second book are in conversation with each other. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those choices or maybe it just wasn't a choice, like maybe it's a continuous conversation that loops. Can you let us know a little bit about that? I mean, for like for the first eight years, my first book came out in 2012. For, so for the past eight years, I've been going around the country saying my second book was going to be, was going to, was going to be a radical departure in linguistic approach or subject matter approach, right? Uh, for some reason, it had ingrained that the second book has to, you know, do a different kind of thing on the page. But all the language that came, kept returning to me was centered in, in queerness and in the border, right? In my familial narratives, how the, uh, the, how the public and the personal uh, intersect again and again in the borderlands. So, you know, my philosophy has always been follow the language, right? So I kept, okay, this is the language, right? This is the second book, right? It, it's adjacent to the first book, right? It continues the utterance of the first book, which I was very happy with, all right? At the end, right? okay, this is what it is. I'm gonna follow it and see where it leads me, right? But I remember doing one thing um, quite different for the second book, right? I started, you know, when writers of color write their stories or poems, often the focus in reviews or in, in, the reception is on the subject matter itself, right? What you are bringing to the table is story, narrative, which is also immensely important, right? And I often feel like maybe technique and craft get displaced by that kind of approach to the work of writers of color. And uh, when I started writing Guillotine, especially the border poems, I started remembering and going back uh, to my parents and relatives after they would come back from work exhausted. They were in the kitchen and there was been an hour or so telling each other stories, jokes, anecdotes. So I, I returned to those, those moments, right, in the family space where language was being used. Not what was being said per se, how it was being said. I paid attention, right, to the way my father brought in uh, wit and humor, right? I paid attention to the way my uncle would have this really kind of like jumpy kind of narrative. This jump from that, that jump to that, right? And I paid attention in my memory to those kind of ways of telling. And I let that, those ways of telling kind of shape the craft uh, for the Testament poems, right? For the poems spoken by these border crossers, right? if that kind of makes sense. So that was so I, I kept tying my familial uh, to the public, right? But not just the story, but the way of telling the story, right? It's embedded in uh, guillotine, right? And that's really in the familial, but it makes visible the public. Right? Okay, thank you, thank you. And Mark, you know, I was just thinking about like what, you know, this idea of origin and what it means in, in your book too, because I feel like in your book, there is a kind of origin, like where does the body begin? Where does the body end? And this story of, of family and friendship, and there's an origin, it seems, there too. Within the AIDS epidemic, there is such a story of like, where does the where does the gay male body begin? Uh, what are its boundaries? Could you talk a little bit about that and also how maybe it flowed from one book to another for you? Yeah, um, in, in your, your original question, you, you asked how we approached history or the past. And, and I felt like with this book, the, the past 
approached me. I was not, I didn't feel like I went looking for it. I was, you know, I had done, I had had three previous books that, um, you know, compared to this one, felt like they were kind of doing similar things. And then this one just came along and asked to be done completely differently. Um, and yeah, and I guess, um, you know, I became aware of my sexuality um, in a, you know, in a tangible way, like when I was 13, 14 years old, um, I wasn't out or anything yet. But that was also when, um, you know, AIDS uh, appeared on the scene in the news. Um, so I, you know, just from the very beginning, um, attached my, who I was to disease and death. Um, so that was fun. Um, <laughs> And, and that's another thing. I mean, there's some, you know, as as sort of, uh, you know, serious as so it, it is an allergy for a, for a particular person in my life who died, but it does a lot of other things. Um, and one of the things that, you know, sort of got us through was humor. Um, and there, you know, I feel like the humor that's in here is often irreverent, but that's that's what that's how we got each other through it, you know, and there was, you know, the, the, the sort of similar situation to the current plague, uh, wherein we had a, um, you know, a president, a government who were not helpful um, in the, you know, in the form of, of Reagan. Um, so that's, you know, that, so that's another, uh, you know, a, a way of in which the um, the past and the future or, or, or the present are all sort of approaching each other and kind of replaying these similar things. Um, you know, and AIDS, AIDS is not a thing of the past, you know, something between a million and a half a million and a million people died of it last year globally. It just, you know, it's, it's out of a lot of our imaginations because of who it affects. Um, so, which is, you know, kind of, where it started as well, so that 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 hasn't hasn't changed, um, and I don't I don't know if um, I don't know if we're going to have time to do the screen sharing thing, but I would love to do that. I would love to do that, uh, Mark, because um, one of the things that Eduardo brought up is um, just this idea of that sometimes craft is 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 overlooked. That sometimes it's the subject matter that's really at the forefront when so much of what poets think about is the crafting of their poems. So I know that there were formal choices that each of you so consciously made in your books that I was so aware of. I was so excited equally looking at what you did on the page, what all of you did with white space, what all of you did with font, um, with artwork, with punctuation. It was so exciting to me. So if any of you would like to share any of what you did on the page, it, I think it would really be thrilling for anybody who is watching. You do you want to go, Mark? Um, I sure I can. I've got I've got my yeah. page up here. So I'll do that. I love what Mark said about the past approaching him and, and, and there's it just popping into my cruise by the past. I mean it's, it's mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I was, yeah, I was never good at that. I suppose you're, you're supposed to like turn around after three seconds. I usually wait five. <laughs> okay, so is that visible? It is. It's okay. visible. Um, so this is the this is the first poem, or I don't know what to call them because it's all one poem. But this is the first piece of the book, um, and it was the first thing that came to me sort of unbidden in the form of a metaphor. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's the metaphor of a, of a burning house and the sparks and flames sort of like carrying over to adjacent houses or not. Um, which when I wrote it, I just had this, this image in my head and didn't connect it to, to, you know, contagion or, or AIDS necessarily. A, a lot of, a lot of what came after sort of filled in um, what my subconscious was sort of trying to do. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, not, um, not having titles just sort of broadly made me think a lot about how the individual pieces were ending in a, in a way that I, I you know, I, maybe didn't do in the same way in a, in a poem with a title and a, a body and an ending. Um, 
and there's no punctuation. So, and I, I again, after the fact, I read this uh, quote by W.S. Merwin, say, who said that the mind does not think in punctuation. So, uh, in some ways, I was trying to, you know, represent sort of just the the, the fluidity and the movement of of memory um, and trauma and uh, uh, and time. And and I found that the only punctuation I needed were these three little hash marks at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um just to sort of delineate the fragments a little bit but thank you thank you mark thank yeah. you i feel like how do how does this time pass so quickly we have a few minutes left so i thought it'd be nice for everyone to kind of like uh just quickly screen share jonah do you, do you mind screen sharing and just uh, talk about it for like a minute or so and then we'll get a chance to just screen share with everybody else oh yeah no problem i'm trying to see if i can find um do you need, do you need I'm going to share, I'll share like the, like the layout copy because <laughs> it doesn't look, um, oh, and maybe I'll share two things. Well, here, let me see. I'll do this one. Can, um, can you see, can you see this? So this is like actually a draft in process, in progress. Um, I'm redrafting, um, the, how the poem looks. So in the book, um, real fast, I'll just get to it, you know, it's laid out. It's the N-word, um, it's a concrete poem that goes, it's just pretty much says like niggas this, 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 for like 10 pages, um, right? Um, so I'm uh, redrafting it here, you can kind of see. And um, you know, I did this pretty simple process. This, is, this poem came out from a, a one, it was a draft, I'm sorry, a prompt to draft a one word poem that I got from, um, at the time, uh, Will Daddario was teaching a poetry, philosophy and performance class. And so, yes, yeah, so I just, I thought about a one word poem that doesn't end. Like, so it's like, um, so niggas. And so this is black ontology number eight. I probably should say that, um, and, I'm sorry, this is black existentialism number eight. So, um, so these poems are kind of like a series of philosophical poems um, or like a pra philosophical praxis um, or forms of philosophical praxis. Um, where I try to actually define or perform, right, the, um, this kind of um, Sisyphean type of, you know, forever and ever and ever on into eternity type thing, right? And so these S's represent linguistically not only just um, a um, kind of instantiation of the pluralized form of the word and the, also the possessive sense or term of the word, but they also just kind of slip in these like very gestalt type um, type little elements right so you might see like the the symbol for like a scolium or um some people tell me they've seen like seahorses or barbed wire um rope um the very last panel is um actually like a cuban link chain um like the chain that i have on right now <laughs> um and so uh thinking about this craft i'm always really interested in like you know pers pers perspective shifts or shifts in perspective gestalt shifts um, you know, things like that. And so I try to play around with it visually, like, you know, some, every little S is, a, is actually a slave or a story or um, yeah. also, right, an instantiation of the actual nigga, of a nigga, so. Thank you, so, yeah. thank you, Jonah, thank you. Uh, Eduardo, do we have time to just uh, flash uh, something of, of yours? Thank you, Jonah. I started seeing these water station barrels, you know, as communal spaces where, uh, where multiple people uh, uh, scratch their language, their thoughts. And as I said, well, it's not only going to be Im migrants or immigrants scratching their language, it's also going to be people who are moving through the desert, gringos, I imagine, white people who do not like immigrants, do not like uh, the expansion of this country, the enriching of this country. So I have all this kind of graffiti of, of both uh, immigrants and uh, uh, racists talking over each other and to each other via graffiti. So. Well, thank you. And Hafiza, do you have anything you'd like to show really quick? I just want to make sure I don't miss sure. anyone. Let's see. Uh, okay, let's see if this works. Mm. Can you see this? Yeah. So this is the uh, poem, the opening poem I read in the opening poem of the book. I, for the record, am allergic to form. It's like math in my head. Oh. This is like, this is like the one <laughs> form, like, and like contrapuntal, like, are so hard with all red oleo. Um, and so this was like my one attempt, the like the book both opens and closes with a, like, like a contrapuntal form, like the ending is like a soft contrapuntal, but 
I figured I'd give it a try. And I wanted to show like kind of like split allegiance that has to funnel down into one country at the end. Um, but, you know, I'll just say for me, like form for me and poetry really is the line break. Maybe it's like the control freak in me, um, but I absolutely love line breaks and how you can create a whole, you can create a whole poem in like just two lines that you send the reader off in one direction and then by the time they get an other line it's not what they thought they were and then that like that other meaning becomes like a haunting or like a palm sets like you know the work which i think is really cool oh thank you everyone as you could see we could all go on for a very long time about each of just just form and craft i could have a whole just hour-long conversation about that I just wanted to thank you all for being so generous. I thank uh, Mark Bibbins, Eduardo C. Corral, Hafiza Jeter, Jonah Mixon Webster. Please make sure that you remember to order their books. As you can see from what they've shown on the screen, it's so fascinating. Um, each of their projects are truly a, a, a journey and I've enjoyed them so much. Please also consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is celebrating its 15th year of presenting free literary programming. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yay.